Hi, welcome back to the channel. As you can see, today we're going to deal with another controversy. Is Christian, is the Christian Christmas Christian or pagan? That's a tongue twister, isn't it? <laughs> um, but before we get started, I need you to subscribe and hit the post notification bell please and please hit the thumbs up button or share the video that helps me and i sure would appreciate it all right so let's get started all right we got to talk about this it's coming up and as much as i want people to know truth i don't know everything i'm sharing what i know i'm going to share a few other videos, which will be short, will give you more information about this subject about Christian Christmas. <laughs> and I really want you to research it. Don't get mad at me uh, or others. It's time for us to wake up and do what is right, all right? And so I'm just here to help you with that. And I would appreciate your prayers as you um, follow along in this video. All right, so we got a couple of things to look at, and I've got a lot of information, and I can't cover it all. I'm not, it's just too much. But there's um, enough information out there that you can find on your own. But this is a, it's probably a divisive subject because this time of year, um, people love this time of year. But while some people love it, there are other people who are, um, as they say, I guess this has to be a new word, unaliving themselves. Uh, we have to use that, I guess, this term of unalive, unaliving themselves this time of year, which is sad. People are uh, destitute and desperate and get very depressed during this time of year while everyone else is being very festive. Okay, and they call it a spirit of the season. And it is a spirit, brothers and sisters, and we're going to find out what that spirit is. So... Let, let's before we get started in the actual uh, paganism of it, let me let me read something to you about Christmas um, here in America. OK, this is where I am. Christmas was declared a federal federal holiday in the United States on June 26, 1870, a federal holiday for the federal employees to um, have a day off. Now, on December 25th, 1789, the U.S. Congress met in session. The nation was without a president, the country's first national election, which began earlier that month, would not conclude until January, while some residents in the nascent United States marked the day as Christmas, for most Americans, it was just a Friday in December. That changed almost 150 years ago when President Ulysses S. Grant signed legislation making Christmas a federal holiday in the District of Columbia. That gave federal workers Christmas Day off. The legislation signed into law on June 28, 1870 also made New Year's Day and the July 4th holidays as well as Thanksgiving, although the date of that holiday had not yet been determined. But in our Thanksgiving video, we determined that it was Lincoln that did it on uh, fourth Thursday of the month. Christmas had been celebrated in some states, especially those in the South, where it was part of the social calendar. Alabama declared Christmas a legal holiday in 1836, and Louisiana and Arkansas followed in 1833. Did not, and they did not um, celebrate Christmas up until that time. They saw the holiday as a decadent, man-made invention. They were not alone. Any Baptists, Quakers and Puritans also believed celebrating Christmas was sinful. Since 
Stephen Cooper, Department Chair of Religious Studies at Franklin and Marshall College, said that there was a Puritan dislike of Christmas, which was grounded in their Calvinistic reform traditions, anti-Catholicism, and more to the point, their opposition to the Anglican Church, which they felt was popish in maintaining Christmas as it was celebrated as a part of the Catholic uh, year. All right, so this is has its pagan, it has its roots in paganism and Catholicism, but we're going to continue. The perception of Christmas began to change in mid-19th century. Immigrants brought their customs with them, and these immigrants, just to be clear, in this particular case were Catholics. And publications featuring cartoonist Thomas Nass, illustrations of Santa Claus, and holiday recipes and decorations became more popular. So during the Civil War, Christmas Day was considered a day of peace and rest, not war. Grant was viewed as the general who saved the Union. When elected president in 1868, one of his goals was to reunite the Union. Ron White, author of American Ulysses, A Life of Ulysses as Grant, has written that Grant was more religious than most have realized. As a Methodist, he sought to follow the church's mission on social justice. Grant saw Christmas and other holidays as a way to bond people from North and South over common holidays. In 1867, in 18, excuse me, in 1647, the Puritan-led English Parliament banned the celebration of Christmas, replacing it with the day of fasting and considering it a popish festival with no biblical jurisdiction and a time of wasteful and immoral behavior. You're going to find out why that is in a moment. Shocking as it sounds, followers of Jesus Christ in both the Americas and England helped pass laws Making the, ob to, making the observance of Christmas, believe it, believing it to be an insult to God to honor a day associated with ancient paganism. According to the book, Shocked by the Bible, a book Thomas Nelson Incorporated uh, published um, December 14, 2010. Even worse for the Puritans were the pagan roots of Christmas. Not until the 4th century AD did the church in Rome ordain the celebration of the nativity of, on December 25th, and that was done by co-opting existing pagan celebrations such as Saturnalia, an ancient Roman holiday of lights marked with drinking and feasting that coincided with the winter solstice. The noted Puritan minister Increase Mather wrote that Christmas occurred on December 25th, not because Christ was born on that month, but because the heathens, Saturnalia, was at that time kept in Rome and they were willing to have those pagan holidays metamorphed into Christian ones according to him. Puritans and um, Puritans believe Christmas was basically just a pagan custom that the Catholics took over without any biblical basis for it. The holiday that had everything to do with the time of year, remember Saturnalia, Saturnalia, the solstice and Saturnalia had nothing to do with Christianity. Let's see here. Now we know why the pagan-like way in which Christmas was celebrated troubled the Puritans, even more than the underlying theology. Men dishonored Christ more in the 12 days of Christmas. Listen to this. You know that song, the 12 days of Christmas? Listen to this. He says, men dishonored Christ more in the 12 days of Christmas than all the 12 months besides, he wrote in 16, 
the 16th century clergyman Hugh Lattimore. That's an unquote. Christmas in the 1600s was hardly a silent night, let alone a holy one. More befitting a rowdy spring break than a sacred occasion. Christ Christmas relevers, relevers used the holiday as an excuse to feast, drink, gamble on dice and cars, and engage in lascivious behavior. Sounds like Mardi Gras, doesn't it? In a yuletide twist on trick-or-treating, men dressed as women, check this out, men dressed as women and vice versa and went door-to-door -door demanding food or money in returns for carols or Christmas wishes. Bands of mostly young people and apprentices would go from house to house and demand the door, that the doors of the prosperous people be open to them. They felt they had a right to enter the houses of the wealthy and demand their highly qualified food and drink. Not meager handouts, but the stuff prosperous people would serve to their own families, unquote. Those who failed to comply with this would be greeted with vandalism or violence. So that door-to-door -door singing Christmas carols, that's the root of where this came from, y'all. Even after public commemoration of Christmas was once gained legal in England following the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, the Yuletide ban remained firmly on the books in Massachusetts for an entire generation. What's a generation? 40 years, 20, 40 years, something like that. Although outlawed in public, the celebration of Christmas endured in private homes particularly in the fishing towns further afield from the center of the Puritan power in Boston. He writes, notorious for irreligion, heavy drinking, and loose sexual activity. That's why it was done out there by them because that's the way they live, those fishermen. In his research, and I can't say this guy's name and I'll have to put it in the um in the description, so you know who I'm, I'm quoting. It's N-I-S-S-E-N-B-A-U-M. Found no records of any prosecutions under the 1659 law. This was not the secret police going after anybody, he said. It clear, It's clear from the wording of a band that the Puritans weren't really concerned with celebrating high holiday in quiet in a quiet way, privately, it was for the preventing of disorders. So they didn't care if people did it privately, but because of the disorderly conduct that followed with these activities is what they were concerned about, it seems to be saying. The prohibition of public Christmas celebrations was unique to Massachusetts. And under the reign of King Charles II, political pressure from the motherland steadily increased from the colonies puritan leaders to relax their intolerant laws or risk losing their royal charter in 1681 the massachusetts bay colony reluctantly repealed its most audulous laws including the ban on christmas it says hostility toward the public celebrations of christmas however remain in massachusetts from years to come when newly appointed royal governor sir edmund And Andros attended a Christmas Day religious service at Boston's townhouse in 18 in 1686. This is so far back I'm getting twisted up and saying it. He prayed and sang hymns while flanked by redcoats guarding against possible violent protests. Until well into the 1800s, businesses and schools in Massachusetts remained open on December 25th while Many churches stayed closed. Until 1856, not until 1856, did Christmas, along with Washington's birthday and the 4th of July, finally become public holiday in Massachusetts. This is a lot, so I'm not going to continue. I didn't realize I had so much about this, but you get the drift of this, okay? Um, I'm just going to um, save some of this, no sense in... I think you get what I'm talking about here. Let's go on to um, a little bit about Saturnalia.
but I'm going to come back to this, okay? Because like I said, I have a lot and I don't want to hold you too long, but I really, really want you to get this, all right? So let's talk about some of the paganism of this day. Um, this is what we call baptized paganism. Many superstitions and pagan philosophies have been been baptized into the church and occupy a prominent place in modern theology. Pagan traditions, practices, and symbols can be traced all the way back to idolatrous Babylon. And you know, in these last days, we're told to call people out of Babylon. These traditions go as far back as Babylon have crept into the church and have become concealed by new names. But let us go back even further than ancient Babylon and trace this history of apostasy. And of course, we'll talk about there was war in heaven with Michael and his angels fought and this whole situation that we're in right now started in heaven because Lucifer, who wanted his way and not God's way, was kicked out of heaven. And here he has come here on this earth to establish his kingdom. So what you're seeing is the kingdom of the enemy being set up here because he's the God of this world. Satan's name used to be Lucifer, which means day star, Isaiah 14, 12. You can see that in the margin. How many stars can you see in the daytime? Just one. They say the sun is a star. All right, it's the great illuminous body called the sun. It is the day star of this earth. Since Satan does not appear in person, he has turned men's attention to worship the sun, the greatest and most powerful luminous body in the visible universe. Therefore, the sun worship forms a part of the most heathen religions. The devil has worked through this these great isms, paganism, heathenism, all kinds of isms in this world to deceive millions. And one of those isms is heathenism. In fact, Satan had more captives in heathenism than any of the isms today. An ancient desire to worship God was instilled in man at creation. But Satan has prevented this desire, has perverted this desire, and has led men to worship the sun instead of the God who created it. And you say, oh, Diane, I don't worship the sun. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Listen, all of this has its connection. Christmas, Sunday worship, all of it's connected in, 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 in paganism. So no doubt there are many well-meaning people who profess to be Christians who have been taught and therefore believe that Easter, which we're not talking about today, but we will, Easter, Christmas, Sunday are biblical institutions established by Christ and kept by the apostles and hence are very sacred. But we can't find any scriptures that tell us this. So it is not our intention in the, here, it is not my intention here to talk about those particular things right now, but we will talk about them in um, time to come. So let's continue. Let's talk about Nimrod. Have any of you ever heard of Nimrod? Heathen philosophy claims that when Nimrod, the great grandson of Noah, died, he was immortalized and his spirit took possession of the sun where he is dwelling as the sun god that's why we got to understand death that's why i'm doing this series on death what happens to us when us when we die but this is because this is how um these superstitions are able to be perpetuated when we don't have the correct understanding so we really must understand what truth is because truth sets us free and understand it from the scriptures so uh initial the t is always a symbol of sun worship. Hear me. It's always a symbol of sun worship. And it stands for Tammuz. It looks like a cross. You hear me? It looks like a cross. A T. This is a capital T. 
This is a small T. When you see these crosses, it stands for Tammuz. Jesus was 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 um, uh, uh, crucified on a stake on a tree, and if he wasn't, even if it was, why? If he was crucified, listen. If he was crucified in an if he, if he was executed in an electric chair, like we have today, would you hang an electric chair around your neck? See, the reason why you know these things are heathen, because heathens take part in it. Not just uh, Christians wearing crosses on their necks. Not just putting crosses, the T's on their churches. Heathens do it. Rock stars do it. If you think they're worshiping Christ, it's not true. And you can't say because you are that that's what yours means. Everything has a meaning and everything has its roots. Okay, so that T stands for Tammuz. And that's, uh, and that's who he was. But let me go on. Semiramis. Let's find out who she is. Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod. I just said Tammuz. Semiramis and Tammuz. Sem is, Semiramis is Tammuz's mother. Nimrod, okay. Um, Nimrod, we're talking about Nimrod, the great-grandson of Noah. Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod, became the great queen. And in order for the people... In order that the people love her, she told them that she would take possession of the moon after she died, just as her husband Nimrod had taken the possession of the sun. And I know I told you this was Tammuz, but it's true. Let me finish. Okay. So, so Nimrod supposedly died, went to the sun, and became the sun god she said i'm gonna when i die i'm gonna take over the moon and be the moon god now you got something going on here listen semiramis never remarried after the death of nimrod but a few years later she gave birth to tammuz on guess what day you ready for it december 25th so she's not married and yet she has a son she has a child out of wedlock so the people don't get upset with her and come after her, the the, uh, the great queen claimed that her son was mir miraculously conceived by the spirit of her dead husband Nimrod. After the death of Semiramis, she was revered by the pagans as the mother god or the queen of heaven. Have you heard that term before? Just know who that is. I don't, remember, I don't care what names, new names they give things. This is the root. She's the queen of heaven. Her son, Tammuz, was called uh, the son of God. Uh-oh. She's dead. Nimrod's dead. Nimrod's in the sun. She's in the moon. And now she's pregnant. And now this illegitimate child is called the son of God because you see that? And worshipped in different lands under various names. He was commonly called Zoraster, meaning the seed of the woman. Are you following me here? What's going on? The devil is counterfeiting the father and son, the Godhead, and counterfeiting the birth of Christ, the Messiah, counterfeiting the miraculous conception of Yahshua by producing a false God and a false mother and son combination. So let's talk about Tammuz. Tammuz was considered the son of the sun, the son, S-O-N, of the S-U-N, because his father Nimrod was now the Son God, the S U N. He's there. So the letter T uh, was afterwards considered the symbol of the sun. The T is a symbol of the sun. Sun worshipers offer to their sun god human sacrifices, which was on a wooden cross, the initial T for the name Tammuz. All right. I'm going to talk about sun worship, but I might hold that for a minute. And let's talk about, for the sake of time, let's talk about Christmas. Because you need to hear this. All right. So, 
Christmas or Christ Mass. You need to understand that this title, Christmas, is a Catholic name. A Mass is something they do for the dead. Christ Mass. So some people are saying, I'm not going to celebrate or say Christmas anymore. I'm going to say Xmas. Okay, so it's an X mass. It's still a mass for the dead, y'all. Wreaths are put on doors for the dead. That's where the wreath comes from. It's for the dead. When someone dies, you put a wreath on the door. Now they're making them so beautiful and colorful, everybody wants a wreath on their door. So Christmas is Christ mass. They just left off one of the S's, but it's a Christ mass has become one of the leading holidays in the world today. I've, I've lived in Japan, and I'm telling you, on the Ginza, th that's a market, during this time of year, my, you, the decorations and the, it sounds, you know, it's like going to the mall now, you see all the festivity in a country that's probably 2% Christian. That's how pagan this is, because nobody's Christian heart. I mean, the majority of people, it's a very small percentage of people that are Christian in Japan. But on the 25th of December is not the birthday of Yahshua, Jesus Christ. It is the birthday of Tammuz. Just know it is. The Bible says that the shepherds were with their flocks. The shepherds were never with their flocks on the hills in the winter. And I've got information about that. Jesus must have been born in a warmer season. Nobody really knows when Jesus was born. You know why? Because the father uh chose not to tell us just like when moses died he chose not to let israel know where moses was buried because he didn't want them worshiping moses like that the father didn't tell us today because he didn't want us worshiping that that was not what was important we know he came but he says but yahshua himself said if you want to do something in remembrance of me i want you to do this and drink this cup and 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 eat my bread eat this bread and drink this cup until I come. And every time you do that, do this in remembrance of the death that I died for you. That's what he told us to do in remembrance, not his birth. And you know, the world doesn't mind the little baby in the cradle. They don't like the grown high priest we have in heaven now sitting on the right hand of the father interceding for us. They don't like him. They don't like him, but they like the little baby. So everybody likes the little baby, but nobody likes the grown man. The man Christ Jesus. They don't they don't appreciate him. Nobody really knows. The Bible does not reveal the date of his birth. Rather, it is the birth of a pagan sun god. But the Church of Rome started calling it the day of Christ, the Son of the true God. That's what they did. People have been taught to trample on God's holy day, the seventh day Sabbath, but at the same time they reverence a day totally pagan in origin and they poo poo it oh that's not important we're not under the law we don't have to do that no more but they do something that's not biblical and they i know some people are gonna be mad at me over this um and i'm sorry i'm not i'm sorry you're mad i'm sorry that you're not willing to go research this for yourself and if you say that you love uh god that you would want to do everything to please him here are the two great commandments love god with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself and that will prove that you're his disciple. If you truly love him, you'll obey him, right? All right. So Tammuz was supposedly the son of Nimrod, who was a great hunter. Now I'm not gonna get into this because this will go into something I'm gonna talk about later. And it's about Easter. We're gonna continue with Nimrod uh, and his life or his death because it coincides with something else. But let's move on to something else I have here um oh when I was talking about them being out in the winter time and it couldn't be because listen to this I don't know where I got this from but it says I might see it when I finish reading but it says here meteorologists as well as historians and astronomers have something of importance to contribute to this question of fixing the date of the birth of Christ. According to St. Luke, and there there were in the same, same country shepherds abiding in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. You know, that's in Luke uh, 2 verse 8. So meteorologists 
have made exact recordings of the temperature at Hebron. This spot in the southern highlands of Judea, Judea exhibits the same climatic conditions as Bethlehem, which is not far distant. The temperature readings show over a period of three months that the incidence of frost as follows. December, 2.8 degrees. January, 1.6. February, 0 0.1 degrees. The first two months have also the greatest rainfall of the year. So that means December and January. Approximately six inches in December and eight in January. According to all the existence information, the climate in Palestine has not changed uh, in at least 2,000 years. Consequently, modern meteorological observations can be taken as a basis. So at Christmas time in Bethlehem is the grip of frost. And in the promised land, no cattle have been in the fields in that temperature. This fact is borne out by the mark in the Talmud to the effect that in the neighborhood, the flocks were put out to grass from March and brought in at the beginning of November. They remained out in the open for almost eight months. Now, the Talmud is a book that the, uh, the Jews use. It's, it, it's a historical book, and it's kind of got some stuff in it but this is what they're saying so they know uh that when luke was talking about his birth it couldn't have been in that deep of winter even though you can have mild winters but remember what the meteorologists are saying that they've seen no change in the temperature in that area for two thousand years so it's cold and no animals would be out and no shepherds would be out with them okay and so when Jesus died at um, in the uh, Passover time, because he was the Passover lamb, when he died, he was. T we were told he was thirty-three and a half years old. If you're a half a year, that means six months have. That's twelve months in the in this calendar year. Then six months of that is half a year. So let's say he died in April. Okay, a bib. April, the beginning, the spring of what is the spring of the year, which is also the biblical new year. So let's go back. April, March, February, January, December, November, October. So that means he would have been born somewhere in September because I can't give a date to when he was birthed. It would have been in the spring of the year at Passover. So somewhere like September, October, somewhere in the fall of the year. Let's put it like that. At those fall feasts that Israel celebrated, he would have been born during that time when shepherds would have been out. They would have been tabernacling as a result of the fall feast, but he would have been born and he would have been six months old or back it up he was uh his his cousin was six months older than he so when yashua died if he died in april he was 33 and a half years old so he would have been 34 six months coming you see so i know this if i'm sounding all messed up please forgive me but you understand what i'm trying to say so uh, <laughs> Listen, I'm going to put some videos down at, at the bottom, uh, three or four of them. I really want you to look at them. They're more precise than I can be. But I do want to leave you with this, some, some scripture, okay? Because I think this is important. Oh, oh, no. I, before I go, bear with me. Just bear with me one more time before I go there. I want to talk to you about Santa Claus. Now, this, some, this is something we're going to put in this video because it is so important that we understand it. We put something to our children at this time of year. We start lying to them very young, telling them about this man. We, we lie about the bunny, we lie about the tooth fairy, and we lie about Santa Claus. And everybody's taking their children to see this man. And the old Saint Nick, he's also called old Saint Nick. And the Miriam 
Webster Dictionary of 1828, this is the meaning of Old Saint Nick. It is a noun used as the name of the devil. Synonyms for Old Saint Nick. Arch fiend, bells above, devil, fiend, Lucifer. Did you hear me? That's the synonyms for Old Nick. Old Saint Nick is the devil. Take the switch and put the N at the put the letter N at the end of the word and you get Satan. And let me tell y'all something. There's a new Christmas movie coming out. I think it's on Disney Plus. I saw the clip. I have it. I don't know how to show it to you. But it's the birthday of the Santa Claus. And all the elves, now if, the, if old Saint Nick is the devil, then these elves are his demons. These are demons, y'all. So the little elves are going to celebrate birthday. And each one has a letter which spells out, we love you. And it says, we love you, Satan. And the wife is annoyed. Oh, she, you know, clutches her pearls. And Santa chuckles and tells her whatever that little elf is to switch places and then it says Santa and everybody goes oh let me tell you something Hollywood puts the truth in your face you sitting there watching this and he puts the truth in your face Satan is Santa Claus think it Santa and Claus C L A U S or C-L-A-W-S. It's the same thing. Satan's Claws. Santa Claus. Satan's Claws. He's also called the father of Christmas. The devil is the father of lies. It is so amazing to me. I, I just had to say that because I didn't want to end without putting that part in there. There's so much to say and I just don't have time. This video is longer than I've ever done. And I'm sorry. And I, if you kept with me this long, please thank you. And let's look at some uh, some some scriptures. Let's le let's le leave with some 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 truths of the Word of God. All right, John eight forty four. Ye are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks it from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So if you've ever connected yourself with this lie of telling your child that Santa is this wonderful old jolly man that's gonna buy the presents that you're working so hard to get and take your child to sit on that stranger's lap you heard that scripture? Truth sets us free, brothers and sisters. Listen to this. Revelation twenty two fourteen. Blessed are they that do his commandments, they that they might have a right to the tree of life, that they may enter in through the gate of the city. But outside are dogs. Now, I don't think it's a dog that barks that God has something against dogs. He has something against these preachers who won't bark and tell you the truth. These are called dogs. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immor immoral and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loves and practice a lie. You love this season. You love these lies. You love it. And this is who's not going to heaven. Okay? We got to be uh, believers. And if you say you're a Christian... You are supposed to love the truth. Yahshua said he was the way, the truth, and the life. But you're saying that this is. Revelation, um, no, I'm not going to read that one. Uh, let's go with uh, Deuteronomy 29, 12, 29. When Yahuwah, your God, cuts off from before you the nation which you go to dispose and you displace them and dwell in their land. Take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you. 
and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their God? I will do likewise. See, this is what the world is doing. And the church has joined in. Paganism, Christianity did not overtake and convert paganism. Paganism converted that church. And if you're a part of something this season, that's, and they say the spirit of this season, put Christ back in the Christmas. He was never in it. Jesus is not the reason for the season. Tamar's is. Uh, 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 paganism is. That's the reason for this season. Just be honest. God wants you to be honest. He continues and says, You shall not worship Yahuwah your God in that way. For every abomination to Yahuwah, which he hates, have done in their gods. And they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add nor take away from it. You shall not worship Yahuwah your God in this way. Do not worship him. Don't say, don't make it about him. Don't try to make it about him. You're only dishonoring him with these heathen customs. He says, I don't, I don't have any pleasure in this. Okay. And then I'm going to go to, um, first Corinthians 10, 20, rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. The next verse says, You cannot drink the cup of Yahuwah and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of Yahuwah's table and the table of demons. Brothers and sisters, friends and family, what table are you going to choose? I know you love this thing, but you got to love. <laughs> he that loves the world's if you love the world, you can't have any part with, with God. You can't have any fellowship with him if you love the world. He says, come out of Babylon. Be ye separate. I thank you for your time. Look at the videos that I post in the description box. They'll be a little bit clearer than I could be. Okay, but I thank you if you stayed with me. I appreciate it. And may the grace and peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all until we meet again in our next video. Shalom.